Good morning, everyone. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. We had a few technical difficulties, but welcome to our Think Like a Scientist Marine Protected Areas Edition. You guys have seen me a lot. You guys know me. Hopefully you love me. My name's Inshika. I'm an ocean educator here at Bridge Aquarium. And with me, I have my friend, Alan. Would you like to introduce yourself again, Alan? Hey guys, I'm Alan. Uh, I'm also an ocean educator here at the aquarium. Uh, and yeah, super stoked to talk to you guys about some marine protected areas today. So, uh, Chica, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to dive right in. Let's do it. All right. Cool. So, so kind of our guiding question for today is just how would you measure the success of an MPA? So, kind of throughout the next, like throughout our presentation, throughout our talk, go ahead and comment if you guys have any ideas. So, Alan, when we talk about the success of an MPA, what does that mean? So marine protected areas uh, are meant to help protect, you know, important species uh, and support in ha important habitats. And so when it comes to uh, keeping like uh, an MPA successful or what makes a successful MPA, there's like a few things that scientists want to look at. Um, one of the main things is, you know, like diversity, um, you know, animals being produced in there. Because one of the main reasons that we really like MPAs is that they help species uh, populations to stay healthy. It helps to keep them from overfishing. So there's like a lot of different things. Um, there's some things like the spillover effect, which we'll talk about soon, which is a really cool phenomenon that scientists learned about from MPAs. And yeah, like you mentioned, this is a good question for you guys to think about as we talk more and more, because, you know, there's lots of different ways. Would you literally measure using tools or would measuring being look at, looking at how the environment is, you know, enacting or, or you know, how the, the MPA is affecting like the, the habitat around it. So that's definitely something good to think about guys as we get more into it. Yeah, so definitely if you have any ideas, go ahead and drop them in the chat. We'll revisit this question, question a little bit later, but first I think we should talk a little bit more about what an MPA is. Cause we've talked about MPAs, marine protected areas on our streams before, but in case you weren't able to watch those, we just wanna kind of revisit that a little bit and get everyone up to speed. So a marine protected area is kind of like, it's, it's basically an underwater park. So it's essentially an area that's protected in the yeah. ocean that um, uh, where the area is protected for resources or to protect animals. Um, uh, they just have some sorts of protections on them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, that no one can go in that area. It's just, there are some protections on it. Yeah, because not, not, not every MPA is like the same, right? There's like different types, um, different, different regulations for like each one, right on Chica? Yeah, so there's there's different levels of MPAs. We'll talk about some of our local MPAs in a little bit and see kind of the difference between the levels. But so we have marine protected areas locally, but we also have them kind of across the world, which is super cool. They're found in all types of habitats. And what's really crazy is that, that the United States has over 1200 MPAs just within the US borders, it's just within our coasts mm -hmm. and everything like that. So I think it's super cool to see that just our country has so many, but across the world, Alan, do you know how many, um, do you have any guesses how many MPAs there are across the entire planet? Oh man, um, I don't know an exact number. Maybe you can, you know, hopefully, hopefully you know the answer to this one, but I'm going to guess maybe, you know, I want to say like, thousands maybe like maybe even tens of thousands like do, do you know the exact number yeah so there's over 13,000 MPAs worldwide and that was based on results from 2016 Whoa. so there's definitely probably more now and so that's basically that's two percent mm -hmm. of the world's oceans only um that are protected but we still we, there's so many MPAs across the entire planet and so it's really cool to see all of the, you can see in this picture, you can see all the different, the dark spots are the areas that are protected. So mm -hmm. it's really cool to see that there's 13,000 different MPAs, but it's only 1%, 2% of the world's oceans, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, because I, I knew about MPAs like in our country. And then when I started learning more about them, when I first learned about MPAs, I was, I was pretty stoked to see that, you know, there's so many around the world. And I know as I read more, that you hear more and more about MPAs hopefully being established in different areas as people realize how important like the oceans are. So I think it's really cool to to see, you know, this this map right here showing, 
the the MPAs like all over the world. So I, I think that's like a it's cool because it's just like kind of like a, a global effort that you know countries are recognizing that these different like ecosystems and the oceans are so important. So you know it's it's we definitely want to protect more of them, but it's it's cool to see them spread out so far. So hopefully hopefully that spread keeps coming. You know. Yeah. Alan, do you know if we have any MPAs right here off the coast of San Diego? Oh boy, we do. Yeah, there's actually one. Uh, yeah, right there. So just off of the coast uh, of the aquarium, there's actually two uh, marine protected areas and they're a little different. So uh, one of them is a, yeah, so right here we have um, one is called an SMCA, which means State Marine Conservation Area. And one is a SMR, which means State Marine Reserve. Now the difference is, is that a in a state marine conservation area, you know, there's some regulations. Uh, well, actually, there's regulations in both, but in a state marine conservation area, uh, only certain species can be fished. Um, so you know, some fishing is still allowed at certain times, um, and so you can you know take maybe certain species. Um, you can only uh, fish at certain hours. So you know, it's still open for human activity, but there's there's regulations on it to protect the species inside. But then on the other side, uh, you have a state marine reserve, which is a completely no no take zone. So you're not allowed to take any wildlife or anything really from the beaches in those areas because that is just really like a safe haven for those animals. And also means that boats are only allowed like during the day and there's no fishing in them. So those state marine reserves are really important because it's just like a total safe haven for the animals and the species that live inside them. Mm -hmm. And not only are there those two, but I believe there are 11 MPAs off the coast of San Diego County. Uh, am I right about that, Angelica? Yes, that's right. So all the way up, all the way up and down our coast, we have MPAs. But in San Diego County, we do have um, 11 different MPAs. So it's really cool. It's really cool to see how much of our coastline is actually protected. So it's really mm -hmm. interesting to kind of look at populations inside and outside of MPAs and. Um, kind of just track that stuff. It's really, it's really interesting to see. And it's a great way to protect all of our ocean animals. Yeah, it's definitely cool. And this is, I, 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 love, I love that we're talking about this because one of my favorite things about the ocean, like we talked about on our, our snorkeling with leopard sharks talk uh, the other day, um, a few weeks ago, is that when you just, you look out at the ocean and you, you just see the, you see the horizon and you see the water and you're, you don't really know what's going on. And like in our talk, we talked about how there's canyons, there's kelp forests, and there's all these different things going on. And then you can also like kind of think of it now. Oh, even underneath there, there's it's like a state park almost. Like you go on a hike in like uh, a nature area, and you'll see signs that say, "Oh, this is like a nature reserve area." And like you know, there's no human activity really, and you can kind of just enjoy it. And this is just like a similar thing too. You know, it's uh, these environments need protecting, just like the ones on land. And so I, I love I love talking about these things because when you just look at the ocean, you really just get like that surface value of just seeing the water. But when you learn about MPAs and different things like that, you know, there's like a lot of stuff going down uh, underneath the water that's really important. So I think it's really cool that we're able to protect those things so much over, like around the coast. Yeah. And remember, if you guys have any questions about marine protected areas, feel free to drop them in the chat. Alan and I will do our best to try to answer those questions for you. So kind of Going back to our guiding question about how you would measure the success of a marine protected area. Um, Alan, do you have any ideas? Yeah, so I think one uh, good way to measure the success of a marine MPA, kind of like one of the first ways, I think, is really, uh, you know, how well that MPA protects the habitat. Because when you get down to the, the bottom line uh, of an MPA, having a healthy habitat is one of the most important things because uh, like these coral reefs you see here, uh, on the left, you see a unhealthy dying uh, bleached coral reef. Um, and then on the other side, you see a healthy flourishing colorful coral reef. And now fish are gonna be able to survive and thrive much more in a healthy uh, protected area. And so just having those, those healthy habitats are really important for uh, you know, just the, the baseline for the success of the MPAs. Yeah. So for one example, uh, like corals, corals are a great example of habitats that we want to protect with MPAs. Yeah. So, and what's really interesting is, so when areas are, so kind of the picture on the, on the left side is kind of like a habitat that's been a little more fished. So what happens sometimes is that 
the ocean bottom is trawled, which means that fishermen take their, na- their nets along the bottom and that'll catch onto coral and break it and make the habitat not very healthy and not a very good place for any animals to survive. So when scientists put in, um, put in regulations about not being able to fish in a certain area, then you can kind of see the progression and see how the habitat flourishes. And if the habitat flourishes, that means the animals will flourish as well. So it definitely creates um, a, a very diverse habitat for a lot of animals. So when the habitat's protected, the animals can be protected as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and like we mentioned, there's there's so many MPAs like around the world. And so, um, you know, obviously we don't have tropical coral reefs off the coast here in San Diego, but, you know, there's reefs in uh, the Pacific Ocean, you know, there's some protected areas in like the South China Sea I was looking up. So there's lots of different MPAs like all over the world for like different types of habitats. And so like, maybe in different more tropical areas there are mpas that are focused on protecting like those coral reefs or if you look more off of our coast um, you might see mpas that are protecting you know sandy shore refugees for uh for leopard sharks or kelp forests where all these animals like to like to live in there's even um in the philippines i was reading about um, mpas that are protecting mangroves and mangroves are really important uh, ecosystems for many fish that are uh, you know, growing up, it's a good place for fish to go from a juvenile and baby stage to growing up. So that's important for their populations. Um, and there's also like MPAs out in the open ocean and the deep ocean. And so, you know, there's the cool thing to learn about MPAs is that there's there's so many different types of ha- habitats that that we want to protect because each of these ecosystems, you know, eventually kind of affects each other, even if they're far away, because, you know, one healthy, happy ocean is is really important. So yeah, protecting all these different habitats is one great way of, of measuring success in MPA. Yeah. And something that I find that kind of blew my mind when I first learned it is that marine protected areas don't just have to be found in the ocean. There's actually parts of the Great Lakes that are protected. Did you know that, Alan? I did not know that, actually. That's that's really cool. I When I think of marine protected areas, I usually think of like the oceans and stuff. And uh, I think I remember hearing about that one time, but I, I kind of forgot about it. So I'm glad you brought it up. Could you yeah. like elaborate more on, on why like the Great Lakes are protected so much? Yeah, so the Great Lakes are pretty big. I'd say people who stand at the edge kind of think that they're an ocean, honestly, because they're just such large lakes. Um, mm-hmm. And oftentimes areas in the Great Lakes are protected kind of to protect shipwrecks and cultural artifacts. So it's kind of, that's more of um, a, just protecting things that have washed up there and just kind of preserving any animals that you might find as well. So it's really cool to see that you can find them in the ocean, but you can also find them in freshwater, which is something that doesn't seem to click if you think about a marine protected area, but I think it's really interesting to think about. Yeah, that's, that definitely is really cool to, to know that, you know, the Great Lakes, uh, you know, they're, yeah, when you mentioned like, they, it looks like an ocean when you stand across it. And I, I remember like, seen the Great Lakes one time and like, yeah, it totally feels like you're just, you're on like another, like another coast in America. And so there's, when you think about how big it is, how many animals and species live in there and also how much, you know, humans benefit from those lakes, it's definitely important to uh, protect those, those big habitats. Yeah. We have a question here from Laura. She asks, how is an MPA created in international waters? And that's definitely a really good question because oftentimes you think that MPAs would be specific to a country, but basically what happens to establish an MPA in international waters, um, the countries that use that area, the like that ocean area, have to kind of work together and agree on the protection objective. So it kind of, you have to, they have to all, sit down and figure out exactly what they want to protect, why they want to protect it and how they're going to protect it and all kind of work together to reach that protection. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I I, I love hearing stuff like that about how, you know, countries come together to, uh, to protect certain areas that they, they value. So very good question, Laura. Yeah. And so another way that we can measure the success of MPAs, which is probably something that most people would, what would be the one that most people think about is monitoring populations. So a big success of MPAs is that it protects, that it protects animals, right? So kind of tracking 
how baby animals survive and grow up to become adult animals. And this animal we have here, um, uh, this is actually a giant sea bass. And we have these animals at our aquarium. And what's really interesting about these guys is it takes, they're a very long lived species. So it takes them a while to grow up. And so when establishing an MPA, scientists have to make sure that they keep in mind that some animals take a long time to grow up and reproduce. So it, they, you can't really mm -hmm. see you can see some benefits of MPAs right away, but sometimes it, it, you can't really see the full effect of an MPA until like 30, 40, 50 years later. Um, yeah, so Alan, do you, do you have any ideas of some animals that are maybe some, that you can see benefits of MPAs a little quicker? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, um, like you mentioned, some animals don't like produce until they reproduce until they get later into their life. For example, like the giant sea bass we see here, that is like a very, very uh, old sea bass. It's one of the oldest animals we have at the aquarium. So it takes a long time for them to reach maturity. Same with animals like sharks and stuff. But a lot of smaller, short-lived animals um, that are good for scientists to study successful MPAs can be things like, like fish, um, like lobsters. And so actually there was a recent study on the Channel Islands uh, with some MPAs that were 10 years old. So like we mentioned, you know, it can take 20 to 30 years sometimes to really show the full effects of an MPA's success. But for this uh, Channel Islands MPAs, uh, some researchers found larger and more abundant lobsters inside the population areas. And in contrast to that, uh, nearby fish areas had fewer and smaller lobsters, meaning that those MPAs were allowing these lobsters to really reach their full potential, which is something you... Um, Something you might not get to see, uh, fish populations now start to go down, or maybe uh, the fish aren't as big as they used to be, but, but thanks to MPA and those safe spaces, it allows those fish to really, you know, reach their full potential. And then, you know, if they choose to move out or leave the MPA, that's, that's, that's totally up to the animals. I, uh, I, I don't really know what they're thinking, so it's kind of up to them to go, go with the flow and just keep swimming. But you know, it's those MPAs really have shown for those short lived species that they are allowing them to grow to bigger and healthier levels, which is really cool to see. Yeah, so definitely um, with lobsters, because they're a, they're a species that's definitely fished quite a bit, the California spiny lobster. And so seeing how different that their populations are from MPAs to non protected areas is really interesting because you can actually, I've gone diving in. Uh, marine protected areas and in not marine protected areas and it's a very clear difference it's really interesting to see like i'll we'll do one dive in a marine protected area and the next one kind of maybe just like 100 yards away and it's it's a very stark difference which is definitely something that's really cool to like see firsthand see how big the lobsters and other fish get and how they're a lot they're a lot less cautious in an mpa mm -hmm. because they don't have to worry yeah so uh I was thinking about something too, like some other animals, uh, like abalones or invertebrates. Do you know um, anything about like how those animals, any examples about how like those animals have been affected by MPAs? Yeah, so definitely. So abalone is a really interesting uh, animal and I love abalone so much because <laughs> it's, so they're actually, in, in, some of the species of abalone are endangered. And in the past people have actually, they're, they're, they, they've been fished to close to extinction because people really love the way that they tasted. So they're an, a species that's protected regardless. They're, the endangered species are protected in the MPAs and outside. But it's really awesome to see that I've, when I first started diving, I didn't see any abalones at all. But now it's been like five, six, seven years. And I've actually started to see abalones within the marine protected areas, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, Antia, you mentioned uh, you scuba, right? You scuba dive. I do. So, I've actually. What's really cool is I've actually been fortunate enough to do population monitoring within um, an MPA. So, I was chosen oh, to no kind of. Sorry. Oh, I said no way. That's that's oh, cool. I didn't know yeah. you'd done that. No, it's it's really really cool. So, I was actually I had a little clipboard and I had all the different species that we ha that we would that are the most common to find. And I just swim along a little transect down the line and just anything I see within like two arm lengths of, of myself, then I would go ahead and write that down. And it was really great for me because they measure this every year to see how the marine protected area is actually helping. helping no way, that's so sick. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, um, just, just question. I, I, I was going to ask, uh, how long when, like when you're diving and you're doing those collections, how long are you usually down there, uh, you know, observing stuff for? So generally each dive of ob observation will be like an hour. Um, so it'll be, mm -hmm. I, I do a transect a couple of times to make sure that I have the data right. Um, and obviously animals swim through and swim away. So it's just kind of tracking all of that stuff. Um, each, so each dive is probably about an hour and we will dive like multiple times, like check it at different points of time just to make sure that everything looks good. And some animals are nocturnal. So diving at different points in the day as well. No way. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Susan. Um, uh, is climate change and the planet heating up having a negative effect on MPAs? Alan, would you like to take this? Yeah, so um, I think climate change uh, and the planet heating up definitely is having effects on the oceans in general. Um, because marine protected areas are just set aside uh, areas um, for protected animals, uh, they're, the oceans still, the ocean chemistry and the animals are still the same in those areas as the other ocean. And so I wouldn't say that, MP, uh, that uh, climate change is affecting, you know, maybe just MPAs. Um, but also all sorts of areas. So, um, for example, animals with uh, calcium carbonate shells are unable um, to form their shells as well as the acidities of the oceans increase. And so climate change has been showing to have some negative effects on the oceans. And, you know, that includes MPAs, that includes, you know, the reserves, the conservation areas, but uh, the oceans just in general are all, all going to feel the same effects uh, of climate change. So, so it's very important that you know we we learn about these things as as tough it can be to talk about them and as sometimes as as um, it's not always the best topic but it, there that's definitely a conversation that's that's good to have because you know we want to find out ways to help protect uh, these MPAs and just all the oceans in general. So great question, Susan. And I, she has another question as well. Are rising um, are rising water levels affecting MPAs as well? That's also a really good question. I'd say it's kind of along the same lines as what Alan had said. It doesn't specifically impact MPAs any stronger, but a lot of MPAs do are like coastal habitats. So as water levels rise, it definitely will affect the like the tide pools and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. talked about uh, you know habitat protection, healthy habitats, and then monitoring populations. And then once you get like a healthy habit. So first we got like a, a nice established MPA, we got a thriving habitat, and now we got some some increased populations. So Anshika, what, do you know uh, there's like a certain effect that we can then uh, see coming out of the MPA? Uh, do you know what that's called or do you want to tell everyone? Yeah, so that's actually the spillover effect. So basically what happens is after these populations are thriving and doing so well in the marine protected areas, real estate's a little bit a little bit in demand so what happens is these animals it gets really crowded in these marine protected areas because they're doing their job and then some animals will actually have to leave the marine protected areas just because there's just no space and so that actually mm -hmm. creates a more populated ocean in general alan would you like to talk a little bit more about that yeah totally so i was doing i read some really cool articles about uh about mpas and the spillover effect and so, yeah, like we like we mentioned, the main the main benefit uh, of like an MPA and a spillover effect is that it allows you know fishermen to fish sustainably without you know decreasing a population in a certain area too much, and then there's no more fish. So when fish are able to reproduce and you know grow from a juvenile uh, stage to a mature stage, you know sometimes they like to leave that area, and once they do. Uh, you know, it's legal to fish them. And that's like a sustainable practice that, you know, governments and fishermen uh, kind of practice together. It's like an understanding that, you know, this uh, this MPA uh, is is meant to give these animals a safe area. And when they leave, it's totally cool to fish them. And for a while, actually, um, that wasn't really totally believed. So when MPAs were first established, uh, I remember reading about some researchers who did see um, fish, uh, you know, growing in the MPAs and then moving out to other areas. But a lot of other scientists and fishermen didn't totally believe it. There was some controversy because there wasn't many studies or 
long enough studies showing the spillover effect. And so actually a scientist named Gary Russ, he studies fisheries management, um, spillover effects. Um, he wrote a really cool paper um, and he used 25 years worth of research to write this paper. So like we mentioned, MPAs um, sometimes can take 20 to 30 years to really show their effects. And so it wasn't until we got this uh, research paper that really, really used all these years of research to help show uh, that MPAs were having this actual spillover effect. And it was something that was actually happening. And a few conclusions that um, Professor Russ came out, uh, came with from his, his paper and his studies was that species richness increases linearly with time uh, since the reserve's establishment. Uh, and that goes for outside the, the reserve as well. So basically what that means is that as time went on, the uh, species uh, richness for the animals in there um, started to increase, meaning that there was less, um, less fish being fished, the populations were growing, um, and then not only inside the area, but outside the area, the populations were growing, meaning that some of these animals must have been moving um, to the outside areas where they were continuing uh, to increase the populations. Another conclusion uh, he discovered was that the uh, effect tapers off with distance from the reserve. So he noticed that the populations and the amount of fish as you get further and further away from the MPA starts to decrease. So that was a kind of way of showing that, you know, the amount of the population increases and all these uh, new new fish were coming from within the MPA because as you get further away, they're, they're, they're starting to decrease. Uh, another interesting thing he found in the conclusion he made, which helped support the spillover effect and the uh, benefit of MPAs, was that larger predatory fish are more common inside and just outside the reserves uh, as well. And so you might think, well, more, more, more larger fish in there, they're eating the fish. That, that can't be a good thing. Well, actually it is because when you see a more large predatory animals in an area, that means there's more food for them, meaning that more fish and more animals are able to, to reproduce. And just the more animals you see in there, like predatory animals, um, like apex predators that are controlling populations, that's all part of a really healthy ecosystem. And, you know, you have the food web, the food chain, and, you know, Predators eating prey, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not the funnest thing, but it's, it's, it's healthy, it's important, it's part of nature. And so noticing those larger animals in there um, was another way to show that the populations were increasing. That's really cool. Yeah, it's great to see, to actually see the results of MPAs. That's definitely a way to measure the success. And something else that's really good about the spillover effect is that since it all, because so a lot of people, a lot of communities depend on on coastal fisheries and things like that. So having more animals inside of a marine protected area, having them spill out, spill out to outside of the borders allows for a little more sustainable practices in terms of fishing, which is really, really interesting to see. Yep, definitely. Yeah, and so this is kind of a question um, for, for everyone. Feel free if you guys have any ideas, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat as well. Um, but really we just wanna, so if you were in charge, of making an MPA, how would you choose what to protect? Do you have any ideas, Alan? Well, honestly, if it were up to me, I would love to protect all the ocean, but that's just not realistic because, you know, we do have to use the ocean for different things like fishing and stuff. So you gotta be, you gotta be selective um, with what you're protecting. And so I think one of the, the first things that I would think about when choosing um, a, a place for an MPA would probably be the diversity. Uh, of, of the area I'm looking at. And so um, areas with high, so there's like a difference between diversity and abundance. Sometimes those, um, those names can get confused. And so when you're looking at an area with uh, high diversity, you're gonna see um, many more species uh, and many different types of species compared to when you see, say like an area that maybe it has hundreds of thousands of sea stars. Like this could be like the sea star capital of the world. And that's where all the sea stars and the sea star president and the sea star council live. And there's just so many sea stars, but there's not a lot of other people. They don't have like a lot of fish swimming around. You know, the, the sea stars are a little scared of everyone else. So it's mainly them. And if you were to say protect that area that is full, full of sea stars, you know, those sea stars are just gonna continue to thrive. But if you were to look at an area that say, maybe had a few sea stars, a few uh, octopuses, many fish, some crustaceans, 
uh, all these different animals. Um, when you protect that, it's going to increase like the populations of all those animals um, more as well. And so I think when you're looking at areas to protect, it's definitely good to kind of look at how protecting a, a big diverse area of different animals um, will eventually over time create just an all around even healthier ecosystem. Because like I mentioned with the predators eating the fish, you know, all these animals work together, even if it doesn't look like it. And the more diverse, uh, more diversity you have uh, in an MPA, I think the more successful it'll be. Uh, because like I said, all these animals work together, whether it's, you know, eating, uh, eating uh, predator eating prey, or maybe it's, uh, uh, what's the word, a keystone species that, uh, that really shapes a population. So diversity is definitely one big thing that people look at. Yeah, definitely. Because when you have a more diverse set of animals, you'll get more animals just you'll kind of diversity will lead to abundance which is really interesting to see and you know how earlier we were talking about how only two percent of the ocean is protected overall yeah. um uh, i think it's really important to talk about the fact that it's really not about just the percentage of the ocean that's protected it's about the location so so scientists really have to make sure they figure out where is the best places to be protected it's better to protect it's quality over quantity here. So you want to make sure you're protecting the right areas to make sure that they're actually mm -hmm. making making progress, actually helping animals. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely a good thing uh, to consider when thinking about that that percentage number. That's a good way to put it in perspective, you know, because a lot of like maybe a lot of the ocean can be open where there's not really a lot going on. But if you really look in and you kind of look at the uh, different marine protected areas, like I. Maybe I challenge you guys after this chat to go look up some different MPAs all around the world and see how they're they're different. But you'll notice that a lot of them focus on areas that really have a lot of high diversity. So that's something you can you can see, like coral reefs, especially coral reefs have so much diversity uh, in them with all the different fish swimming around. So that's one reason why they're a big focus of MPAs. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so kind of I think the next place we can go is how can you help? So kind of just in general as as someone who goes to the beach what do you how do you interact with mpas kind of on a daily basis so here you can see that people are snorkeling a lot alan what are some other ways people interact with mpas yeah so there's you know you can do activities in mpas like we mentioned um you know just because there's an mpa doesn't mean there's no human activity there, there can be human activity with guidelines so in this picture you see here we have some people snorkeling in the La Jolla Cove in the State Marine Reserve, where you can observe leopard sharks and really see, uh, really see how they're uh, how they're thriving in their in their marine protected area. So, to me personally, you know, going out and experiencing these marine protected areas is a, is like one cool way to help because I this is it's kind of like a, a weird way I think about things, but you know, you go or you take someone and you show them how cool like this area is, and they say. You know, like I've taken people, like I've taken people to snorkel with these leopard sharks, and they go, "Oh, like wow! I didn't know there were so many like fish and sharks and animals here." I'm like, "Yeah, it's like a marine protected area. It's totally safe. Like we're allowed to be here and looking at them and just observing and letting them do their thing." And you know, I the reason why I like education is because you educate people about things, they pass it on, and it just inspires people's passion to you know help protect and support these MPAs. And then there's also other ways too, like um, you can do. MPA watches, which uh, is some sort of volunteering. I don't know too much about that, but Anshika, are you familiar with uh, MPA watches? I actually am. So I actually did a couple of surveys um, in college and basically what it is, is you just go to mpawatch.org, I believe is the website, and then you can actually just get a sheet and keep track. Cause basically what you're doing there is you're being a scientist, you're doing citizen science and making sure you see how people are using the MPA. So you're keeping track of people who are surfing, people who are swimming, people snorkeling, and just seeing on like a Saturday, what what does the population look like? How how are people enjoying the MPA? So it's really cool to see how effective this MPA is and what ways people are actually using it. Yeah, I think that's a really cool point you bring up that you know any anyone anyone can do that really. And I think that's something that uh, is really that's like one of my favorite things about scientists and like being a science and, and being involved in science is you don't have to like have a degree in science. You don't have to work in a lab. You don't have to, 
you know, you don't have to really know much about science to be a, a scientist. You, you just have to have that sense of, you know, that curiosity. If you see something, you observe a phenomenon and you have questions and you want to study and know why it happens. Like as long as you're curious and you have questions and you want to learn, you know, anyone can be a scientist. So, you know, just because, you know, we work at the aquarium and we've studied, we've studied science for a while, but even, even you guys at home, even if you've never, never considered science your thing, you know, that's something you can do and anyone can really be a scientist. There's also other ways yes. like a, a clean, clean swell. It's an app by Ocean Conservancy and it's where you pick up trash and then the app records it and utilizes the data to identify trends. So that's just another way that, you know, you can help uh, in this global effort to, you know, protect our oceans and really protect these areas. Yeah. And another way for if anyone out there are scuba divers, you can definitely use. So I there's this certification program called Reef Check, which basically is a way to go diving and also keep and do citizen science. So doing what I was talking about, how I was able to collect data and keep track of populations. Um, so I was able to just do that. And it's another certification you can get where you are able to identify a bunch of different animals and just keep track of what populations look like. Cause that's basically all run by citizen scientists. So just volunteer divers who want to go out and actually help keep track of populations. Yeah. And I think it's so awesome that we can do that. Cause as we saw uh, with the amount of global MPAs in so many different countries and around the world, even in international waters where countries are working together to establish them, you know, the, the protection of these oceans, is, it's a global effort and it doesn't stop with, uh, you know, organizations that protect them or governments that establish the MPAs, but it can go all the way down to just the little guys like us who want to go out and just, you know, do our best to help them. So I think it's really, it's really cool to see ways that, you know, people like us can help uh, these MPAs and like hearing about how governments around the world are making like a global effort to protect these oceans because, you know, we're starting to learn more and more about them. There's still so much we need to learn about the oceans, which is one of my just favorite parts about the oceans. There's so much mystery and yeah. you know, we can all we can all help do that. And and yeah, I just think that's really awesome. Yeah, I love marine protected areas. I think they're just such a useful thing when used properly and just when things are very specific and are made to put just in the right areas, I think they can do so much to help our oceans. Yeah, definitely really awesome. And uh, yeah, just so cool to think about like, it's just the oceans. I don't know, I'm at a loss for words. I just, I love the oceans, dude. <laughs> okay, I, I feel that, awesome. Well, I think we're actually out of time. Um, uh, so I just want to thank you guys for joining us. I hope you guys learned a lot about MPAs and I hope you go explore your local MPAs sometime soon. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in guys. It was a blast. Thank you.